The Water Gore, written by Smokey Baltic. Chapter 10, October 1999. Hermione glanced at the clock. Her hand was beginning to cramp with all her note-taking, but the lecture, her last of the week, was already five minutes over time, so she was sure it couldn't go on much longer. Gila Rossi apparently had a real passion for fractures because she talked her way through four false starts at class dismissal before finally concluding with, All right, well, I hope you all have been paying attention because I'm going to expect two rolls of parchment on the best approach for healing the musculoskeletal system comprehensively using potions. And if you think I won't notice if you try to skip over joint realignment, you're going to be bitterly disappointed. Due next Friday and you'll need a passing grade if you expect to participate in the practical rotation at St. Mungo's next month. Hermione jotted down joint realignment, and then a few initial thoughts on the topic as the classroom began to empty. She was still scribbling away when her concentration was broken by someone clearing their throat. Granger? Hmm? Oh, she looked up in surprise to find Theo Knott, her lanky, bespectacled classmate hovering over her. Knott, did you need notes? All set, thanks. It's Friday, you know. Time to cut loose, forget about orthopaedic trauma for a few hours. She hummed non-committally and rose from her desk, beginning to gather her things. They weren't friends. They didn't talk. I was thinking of heading to the Giddy Goblin. Do you know it? Bit out of the way, but there's no grimy little pub finer. I see. She didn't. Yeah, I'll probably head there around eight or so. She stuffed the last of her notes and books into her satchel. She didn't know why Theo wanted to give her a preview of his weekend, but she could feel the probability of profound awkwardness increasing by the second. That's nice, she offered as she headed for the door. It is, thanks. He fell into step with her. You see, a friend of mine finished his house arrest this week, so I thought I'd take him out to celebrate. Hermione's step hitched and she turned to him with narrowed eyes. Theo was smiling blandly. He's a real surly tosser. Doesn't actually want to go, but I've talked him into it. Duty of a best mate, you know. Aha. Uh -huh. The thing is, he's made it very clear that he doesn't want me to talk to certain people, you know, people that I in particular might run into on a day-to-day -day basis, about him at all. Very specific and graphic consequences were mentioned, which is, of course, why I would never say anything about him and would only discuss my own plans as they naturally arose in general small talk with whoever was about. Right. They had reached the building lobby where their classmates were departing through the flues. Theo stopped and fixed her with a knowing look. Giddy Goblin, eight o'clock. Then he walked off out through the front door. Four hours of nausea and fierce internal debate followed. What did Theo know? What had Draco said? It was exactly half seven. Hermione surveyed herself in the mirror, fiddling with her hair, looking for flaws in her makeup or clothing that she could use to delay her departure a little longer. Maybe even some dire blemish that would compel her to forego the whole thing. She studied her reflection with a dogged pessimism. Her makeup was undeniably flawless, natural looking, but imparting a dewy glow. Her lips looked incredible. The curls that usually caused her no end of trouble cascaded past her shoulders in gleaming romantic waves. Damn it! No help there. She adjusted her blouse, a low-cut burgundy, sheer-sleeved number that hadn't seen the light of day since she toted it home from the shop months ago. Appropriate for the giddy goblin? She had no idea, but after several torturous surveys of her closet, it was the only thing she didn't hate at this point. She wished she could consult with Ginny about this, any of this. But she hadn't exactly been forthright with her friends about Draco, so that conversation would require more explanation than she cared to give in exchange for opinions on her outfit. Although she might have been willing to brave the shitstorm if she thought Ginny could give her advice on what the fuck she was supposed to say. She had not seen, spoken to, or heard from Draco since she'd entrusted him to the tender mercies of the Snatchers a year and a half ago. His trial had been held behind closed doors. Kingsley had assured her that all was fair and above board, that sometimes trials were conducted that way if sensitive information might be divulged, or if a defendant were cooperating with the Auras. But she still didn't trust it. 
she'd written a pithy 32-page letter to be submitted as part of the defence, full of compelling moral arguments, emotionally fraught analogies, the spectre of history's judgment, and citing Muggle, as well as magical precedents for diminished responsibility. Kingsley had glanced over the letter, rubbed his temples, and handed it back. She'd had to rewrite it, one page, only her own first-hand experience. It had been a brutal caffeine and vodka fueled affair that had cost her more sleep than she cared to mention, but she'd channelled her inner Slytherin to clothe blatantly coercive arguments in the guise of a disinterested narrative. On one page, she had no idea if it did any good. Harry wrote a letter, too. Well, Hermione wrote a letter that Harry signed, under only the mildest duress. Her black skirt was short. Was it too short? Fuck! She didn't even know what she wanted out of this, but the anxiety was sufficient to keep the question of whether she might be physically ill at the forefront of her mind. It was now 7.32pm. Damn it, damn it. She shoved back the seat of her vanity and stood. Enough was enough. She was the fucking golden girl, a hero of the Battle of Hogwarts, brightest fucking witch of her age. She could handle this. She stormed her flu, and when it spat her out at a small bodega-esque wizarding establishment in Camden, her momentum carried her out into the street and down the half-block to where she caught sight of the giddy goblin. Discretion was maintained by means of a powerful, muggle-repelling charm that rolled over her with a tickling sensation that had her skittering in the first few steps after she crossed the threshold. It was a nondescript pub, inside and out, but the clientele definitely gave it colour. She wouldn't even want to wager on what percentage of the patrons were fully human. She was early, but that was to plan. Bellying up to the bar, she ordered herself a glass of Pinot Noir and staked out a spot that afforded her a fair view while providing a degree of cover. Gryffindor, though she may be, there was no need to go charging blindly into the fray. Better to scope it out, get the lay of the land, and then look for an opportune moment to... something. That bit of the plan was still unclear. Aside from his sentencing, she didn't know anything about what had happened to Draco since their time marauding around Scotland. There had been only a few weeks between the time the Snatchers had retrieved him and the defeat of Voldemort at the Battle of Hogwarts. But that seemed time aplenty when Hermione had spent scarcely an hour with Bellatrix Lestrange and wasn't ever likely to forget it. He'd anticipated being disowned, but had been sentenced to house arrest along with his mother, so that relationship was obviously better than he expected. Or was now much, much worse. Either way, he'd just spent a lot of time with a woman who was a dedicated blood supremacist and very much invested in Draco's personal life. It would be awfully easy to fall back into old elitist habits, wouldn't it? How high could the appeal of resuming a muggle-born acquaintance be just now? What had happened between them felt real and intense to her, but might not be more than a wartime footnote to him. A mad little detour to be remembered with a wry twist of the lips and shake of the head. She shouldn't have come. Bad idea. Bad, bad, bad idea. She upended her wine glass and was just twisting off her bar stool when the pub door swung open and Theo walked through. Her tall classmate partially obscured the wizards who followed close behind him, but the shock of distinctive white blonde hair was unmissable, and she instantly recognised the dark, broad-shouldered figure of Blaise Zabini. She fairly leapt back up onto her seat just as the bartender came over to offer her a refill. Yes, please, she said, trying not to look manic as she indicated it ought to be a large refill. A few tense minutes were spent with her hand to the side of her face, obscuring her identity to most of the pub. There was a brief scare when a round, elderly wizard approached on her opposite side and declared, Oh, my stars, you're Hermione Granger! But she managed to diffuse that situation with some rapid-fire pleasantries she dispatched at barely more than a whisper. Eventually, though, she had to look. As nonchalantly as she could, she brushed her hair aside to look over her shoulder. There was a bench seating all along the far wall, and the wizards in question had settled into the corner, their glasses and a bottle of whiskey spread over two small tables. She could see Draco in profile, but the other two wizards were facing her much more directly. He looked... alive. 
the reality of him safe and whole had her gripping the edge of the bar with white knuckles. She didn't realize how hard that alone would hit her, some unsettled little thing that had been agitating beneath her breastbone for more than a year came suddenly to rest. No longer gaunt or unshaven, he still looked older than his years, but it wasn't in the haggard way it had been, more self-possessed. Her eyes roamed hungrily over his hands, his hair, his eyes, the haughty lift of his chin, and his irritating hint of a smirk. Yes, all her favourite bits were accounted for. She turned back toward the bar, biting her lip and bouncing her knee. What to do? Just then, a particular bottle caught her eye and inspiration struck. Hailing the bartender, she ordered up a glass of the cheapest white Zinfandel he had on offer, preferably from a bottle that had been open a while, to be sent to the very blonde gentleman in the corner. Her heart was pounding as she watched him walk it over to their table and hand the glass to Draco. He frowned down at it, bewildered, then sniffed at it and recoiled. The bartender bent a little to say something to him and then pointed in her direction. Draco's gaze followed where he was indicating until his eyes met hers, and then he inhaled sharply, his eyes widening a little. Hermione raised her own glass in salute and offered a tentative smile. He whipped back around and began speaking angrily to Theo, who put his hands up defensively. Well, that answered that. And here she sat, smiling like an idiot. Draco looked back in her direction for a second, then back at Theo, then just to his side. He seemed so angry. Theo gave him a nudge and he just shook his head, scowling, glancing back down again before picking up and draining his glass of whiskey. She should leave and murder Theo. But that's when she noticed the cane. Leaning against the bench beside him was a black cane with an elaborately engraved silver handle. It practically screamed, Malfoy. Of course it must be his. Her gaze darted back up and she found him watching her look at it. He grit his teeth and took hold of the handle. Well, fuck that. She set her glass down and strode over with purpose, head up, shoulders back. He was standing when she arrived. Granger. The drawl seemed forced. Malfoy, she greeted, and then without breaking eye contact. Not Zabini. What are you doing here? Fancied a drink. He sighed. Can we? He indicated for her to step away from the table and its avid listeners. She complied, but the little surge of adrenaline that had propelled her across the room was ebbing away, and she found herself crossing her arms self-consciously. Her stomach twisted when she saw how heavily he limped as he followed. Why are you here? he frowned. Should I not be? I thought you were smart enough to pretend you didn't know me. His eyes flicked between hers. I'd never pretend I didn't know you. Gryffindor, he accused. A real Slytherin would take advantage of that. Who says I'm not? She bit her lip. Well, you should be making the most of it then, shouldn't you? Rest assured, there will be headlines tomorrow. Golden girl deigns to speak with loathsome evil little cockroach. Absolution imminent. A worthy enough cause, I suppose. Waste of capital. Hermione felt her facade cracking and ducked her head. She couldn't look at him as she asked, Do you, do you hate me? Granger! She peeked up at him miserably. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't want to, but... Don't do that, he cut her off. Just don't. You know you could have been killed. She frowned down at her shoes some more, not sure what to say. That was a really stupid fucking risk, he continued. She shrugged. He bumped a knuckle under her chin to get her to look up at him. Seriously, never again, Granger. I'll remember that. She couldn't quite bite back a smile. For the next time... He ducked his head to hide his own smile before his grey eyes caught hers. Thank you, he said quietly, earnestly. She clutched at her heart like she'd had the shock of her life. Holy shit, I'm going to have to buy a pensive. Draco Malfoy just thanked me for something. He gave a resigned sigh. You know, I really thought my memory was embellishing all the sass I got from you. I thought, no, she couldn't possibly have been that cheeky. But here we are. Maybe you just bring out the best in me best, is it? Or worst. Hard to say which is which sometimes. Ah, well, that makes more sense. They looked at each other for a long moment. She had to work hard to resist the temptation to reach out and touch him, to confirm his existence. Eventually, she settled for tentatively asking, how are you? Fine, I'm fine. Your leg? It's fine. Still hurts, but it's fine. It was close. 
They wanted to amputate, but Mother wouldn't let them. I'm sorry, she said quietly, but he shook it off. You made it to Hogwarts in the end? Yeah, a week or so before the battle. She winced a little. She hated talking about it and was relieved he didn't press. Theo says you sailed into the healer training program. She brightened. Eight NEWTs, all O's. Eight? Wow, that's impressive. And you? I believe we had a wager. Yes, well, I must admit, I got one exceeds expectations, in astronomy of all things, he conceded as Hermione smirked triumphantly. But of course, in my other eight NEWTs, I had all O's. Other eight, but what? Muggle studies! Muggle studies? That doesn't count. I would have got an O if I took that. But you didn't, though. Motherfucker, she hissed. Draco had never looked so pleased. What did we wager, anyway? I don't even remember. It doesn't matter. You win all my pride and self-respect and just all the foundational elements of my understanding of myself as a human. It's all forfeit. Fucking muggle studies. Oh, come on, love. It's not so bad. She looked up sharply at the endearment. Draco, too, seemed aware of the slip because he cleared his throat and shifted uneasily. So I heard you and the weasel are a thing, he said evenly. I'm happy for you. She snorted. No, you're not. No, I'm not. He glanced down before catching her eye again. Don't seem that compatible. You don't know the half of it. He cocked an eyebrow. He's with someone else. Our relationship is a bit of a con for the press. Ron and Seamus aren't ready to go public, and I... Well. And you? He prompted. I'm a bit hung up on someone I'm not supposed to be, as it turns out. His eyes searched hers. She bit her lip and gave a half shrug. Really? Yeah. Really? His voice wavered as he raised a hand to curl around the nape of her neck, his thumb brushing along her jaw. She nodded, not quite able to meet his eyes, staring instead at his lips, waiting for him to hand down the verdict. It better not be fucking Potter. She laughed and shook her head, grabbing a fistful of the front of his shirt. Hermione. There was a ragged edge to his voice that caused a cataclysm in her chest. And that was her limit. She pushed up on her tiptoes and gave his shirt a tug to bring him closer. Her lips found his and she felt it everywhere. She pulled away to gauge his reaction, but he only followed, reclaiming her mouth with a slow, deep kiss as his arms wound around her. She pressed herself to him, threading her hands into his hair as she thrilled at the brush of his tongue against hers. Her soul felt too big for her body. There may have been some initial noises which they filtered out, distracted as they were, but it wasn't long before a veritable chorus of catcalls had them self-consciously pulling apart, although their hands remained linked. Blaze gave a final appreciative wolf whistle. This is really okay? Draco squeezed her hand. Hermione's cheeks were flushed as she nodded. She couldn't keep the smile off her face. I don't suppose... He glanced around. You fancy an audience? That's, uh, probably something we should work up, don't you think? She teased. He looked down at her with a familiar, fond exasperation. Why do I like you? Best not examine it too closely. Anyway, I was thinking... He tugged her a little closer. Of leaving. Yeah? Apparating, maybe. Thought I should maybe coordinate that with you. We hope you enjoyed this chapter. Please consider supporting our project by joining our Patreon linked in the description. Or become a member here on YouTube, where you will get access to several additional chapters weeks before they release on YouTube.